Okay, it's my pleasure to speak with you this afternoon about children eating insects and really loving those larvae and grabbing grubs for uh, grub. There's a saying in Zaire, and I'll reinforce the reason for this, that caterpillars and meat play the same role in the human body. Now, I will confess that I'm an absolute, as a physician and nutrition person, I'm an absolute ignoramus about insects. Uh, but like many um, ignorant people, that doesn't stop me from having a strong opinion. And so I'll use this pulpit and uh, assume the role of a pundit to propose something that today I'll call pillar power, uh, which is about the consumption of a cereal that has uh, Mopani worms in it. So here's our series of distinguished session speakers today. And we'll be uh, suggesting, as this pig does, that uh, kids should eat uh, insects. As many of you are aware, it's a, uh, we live in two separate worlds. There is the one-third world, which is highly developed. And you see here uh, our figure of Ronald and the lard lad. And then you see what the two-thirds world looks like with very different levels of growth in these two children in the lower right corner. And so really, as all of you are well aware, children grow very rapidly, and that's here in the WHO growth standards, where in fact a child will uh, double his birth weight by about four to six months and then triple it by a year. And over that first year, the child will gain about 50% in their length. And so growth monitoring is really our most effective way of assessing a child's uh, growth. And here are some of the pictures of that malnourished children from various areas of the world. We use the term protein energy malnutrition because as many of you understand, in the face of inadequate amounts of energy, uh, the protein will be converted then to essentially uh, carbon skeletons and glucose sources for the child's use of energy. And so they're highly interrelated. So it would be fallacious to think about just protein requirements without meeting your uh, energy requirements at the same time. This is particularly a condition of young children and is reflected in inadequate intakes of energy and protein for their growth, oftentimes with other micro, with micronutrient deficiencies, most predominantly uh, iron and vitamin A around the world. To show you this, the dimensions of this problem, which you oftentimes see and hear about on TV, essentially uh, this year, Almost 11 million children less than five years of age will die, largely of undernutrition. We don't think about that very much in the U.S. because 70 percent of these uh, children are in Africa and Southeast Asia. And in terms of many of you are thinking about, for instance, if you thought about global health, you, the first thing that might come to your mind would be uh, HIV disease. Uh, but in fact, in terms of the global burden of diseases attributable to these 20 top risk factors, you can see that underweight or zinc deficiency, another common micronutrient deficiency or vitamin A deficiency, vastly exceed in terms of disease burden around the world the contributions of unsafe sex, high blood pressure, uh, tobacco, etc. And yet we're underfunded for that research in undernutrition. And it really is a matter of, of the child's malnutrition, and we've talked about the deaths. Well, there are just as much and many more children who are disabled in various ways, and this has a significant impact on their uh, cognitive development. But that's the reflection of inadequate diets, largely. And inadequate diets are largely the reflection of insufficient access to food quality and to food quantity. And then, of course, a major issue being poor water sources and inadequate uh, hygienic, hygienic preparation of food. So the causes of severe child under malnutrition, as you would expect, relate to 
inadequate duration of breastfeeding and also most predominantly for today's talk I'll talk about inappropriate complementary foods. Now many of you think of what we used to call these foods as weaning foods but we've reconceptualized that because we're really not trying to wean the child from the breast through that first 24 or 36 months of age. We're really talking about foods that complement those uh, that source of breast milk. And so it really is important because as many of you appreciate the type of complementary food used most commonly around the world because of children's limited chewing and swallowing capacity is oftentimes a porridge of various sorts. And all of those porridges, be they rice cereal as we use commonly in the U.S. or cassava as is used in Africa so commonly, are all poor sources of protein as a percentage of the uh, calories in the feed. And number two, it's a plant protein, which is not as high quality then as a uh, animal protein. The challenge, of course, is that if the child doesn't grow, well in that first two years of life, that growth failure is essentially irreversible. And that's probably true of the effects on mental development as well. And even more significant than that is the fact that there's an intergenerational transmission of malnutrition. Because of course that child who's malnourished grows into a teen who's malnourished if they survive who then the females will conceive, oftentimes in their teens, and then due to the lack of nutrition in that uh, village, will end up giving birth to a low birth weight baby, and then the cycle starts all over again. So there is this transmission. And what do children die of with malnutrition is they actually die of infection. And so there is a vicious cycle where inadequate dietary intake affects uh, causes weight loss and actually then lowers their ability to fight off infection. And then that, of course, follows with, like all infections, a period of anorexia, that is poor intake, and then the cycle starts all over again. And ultimately, after a series of these cycles, uh, the child dies of what we would consider in the U.S. a routine infection. And here, just to show you that as a function of a child's weight for age, and as the child becomes further and further away from the norm, that simple infections that we think of as just relatively harmless in the U.S., like diarrhea or even viral pneumonias, like for instance with measles, carries a tenfold risk of death in a severely underweight child. And so that combination of nutrition and infection uh, is incredibly important, that synergy. And what's the prevention then of malnutrition around the world? Well, it's early, that is in the first 24 hours, exclusive, nothing other than breast milk for the first five to six months, and extended breastfeeding through 24 months. And then appropriate complementary foods. And children through that period of, of six through about 24 months are on these series of transitional foods that we've just called complementary foods. Because after six months of age, breast milk is insufficient in its calories for what that child needs. And so over the second year of life, for instance, between one and two years of life, the child needs an additional 500 calories a day on top of the 500 or so that are coming from the breast milk. So the question is, what food would you feed? And the challenge is that it must be introduced timely, that is, not too early, not too late, that it must be adequate in both nutrient density in terms of adequate protein and carbohydrate and fat and micronutrients and that it be sufficiently dense in calories because children have very small stomachs 
and that it then be prepared in a safe way, and that is both in terms of using a safe water source and hygienic food preparation, and that it be fed appropriately to the child. And that the WHO has suggested that we start at six months, we practice that good hygiene, and we increase gradually the child's food consistency and their variety. So let's focus initially on the therapy of protein energy malnutrition, and then we'll talk about its prevention. So here's a child who was treated effectively. You can see on the left, this is his pretreatment condition, and then on the right, the post-treatment uh, condition. And how did this child succeed in regaining this both body weight? And you can see the totally different uh, affect of the child uh, to a much happier child who seems much more attentive to his environment and less frightened. And in this case, a ready-to-use therapeutic feeding was used. And in that, and a ready-to-use therapeutic feeding is a term that nutritionists use for a very calorically dense product that is also rich in protein that can be transported easily and that is storable for years and is not going to be contaminated by bacteria. And the product produced around the world now by a company called Nutriset is Plumpy Nut. And Plumpy Nut, the secret of Plumpy Nut is that in three ounces it has 500 calories. So two packets a day would be the way to treat orally a child with undernutrition who would normally years ago, 5, 10, 15 years ago, have been hospitalized in hosp have been hospitalized for this. So it's actually outpatient treatment. How do they attain such high uh, nutrient density? Well, they use vegetable oil, peanut butter, dry skim milk, and some sugar and then a vitamin and mineral mix. And essentially, that's Plumpy Nut. And it's composed of about, oops, sorry, about 10% of the calories in Plumpy Nut are coming from a high quality protein, that is from the dried skim milk. And about 60% of the calories come from the fat. And as I said, it's transportable, it stores for years, it comes in small foil packets, it's squeezed into the infant's mouth, and as long as the child can take uh, orally, then it's very effective. Now, the challenge is that it's under patent with Nutriset, and it's expensive because of the dried skim milk. And dried skim milk powder is about 60% of the ingredient costs in the product, and ingredients are 70% of the product cost, and so the skim milk product, powder rather is about 40 to 50% of the product cost. Now, when I start thinking about peanut butter and nutrition, I can't help but think about uh, Reese's contributions to uh, good, healthy uh, intake for many of us. I call this a, a fantasy food, but actually what I'm going to focus on in the remainder of my talk is insects as infant foods. And I'm going to be talking about M&Ms, in this case, not the ones you're thinking about from Mars bars, but uh, mealworms and Mopani worms. And one of the challenges I see is that I think we can forget the freaky stuff, the fancy stuff, the foodie stuff, the fanatic stuff, the plain folly, and the fear factor fluff connected with eating insects. And let's focus on foods for little folks with form that follows function. And so I'm going to talk about a ready-to-use therapeutic feed, and I'm going to talk about a cereal and porridge. Because insects, as David suggested, are good quality protein, rich in lipids, particularly essential fatty acids, that's linoleic and linolenic acid. They have high reproduction rates, high food feed efficiency rates, and they have less ecological impacts. So. When we think about, now, one man's fries is another man's folly. So you might be thinking about this uh, Papuan um, fry larvae on the left, or a French fry, or if you got the larvae together with the French fry, there might be some strange consequences. 
So I'm going to start with talking about a really, just this is an example, a theoretical example of a ready-to-use therapeutic feed based in mealworms. And it's a combination of mealworms, whose composition is on this slide with much too much detail for you, maize flour, and vegetable oil. But here I've composed a product, a theoretical product. I've not made this product. And that is called EchoStar, which, is a, which I use as a, just a fancy word for a combination of ecology and instar. And it's 27% of its weight is dry mealworm larvae. About 50% is maize flour, which of course is corn flour, which is very inexpensive, and then vegetable oil. If you combine these products, add the vitamin mineral mix and maybe a little sugar for taste, you produce this product then that is a mimic of Plumpy Nut in that it has 530 calories in three ounces, 14% of the protein, when most children really require only 8 to 10% of their energy from high quality protein, and then a significant 56% of the calories are coming from lipid, and then the remainder, of course, is carbohydrate. And because it's a very low water product, it would be similar in its stability to Plumpy Nut. Now let's turn our attention to the other M, the Mopani worm, which uh, here in a figure in the Atlanta airport is uh, a traditional food source in Zimbabwe. So this person emerging from the rock as is holding two different Mopani worm, or two Mopani worms. So I'm going to propose that we make a Mopani worm cassava cereal. The challenge of cassava, which is used as a root tuber used throughout Africa and ground into a pulp, is that it's a very poor source of protein. It's almost pure starch with only 1 to 2 percent of the calories coming from protein when an infant needs 8 to 10 percent, and it's a poor quality protein. And that's in fact what children are consuming. So I'm going to suggest that we use Mopani larvae dried, and have their composition, and the, and the cassava, and that we make a product that I'll call pillar power into a porridge that's protein enriched, I do that as a uh, thing if I'm seeing that I can pronounce all the P words. And actually then, this is 20% dried Mopani worms, cassava flour, has a significant caloric density with 12% of the energy coming from high quality protein. It's a relatively low fat source, but enough to provide the essential fatty acids. And of course, it's carbohydrate rich. The challenge with Mopani worms is that they're being eaten into extinction uh, because of a lack of sustainable harvesting and overexploitation and drought. Now, how doable is this concept? Well, Mopani worms have been grown in the lab with 90% survival. Uh, we, they're separated from the adults to protect them against parasites and viruses. Harvesting Mopani worms at Instar, 5, at Instar 5 at essentially a month is that they typically weigh 7 grams with about 61% of the worm being uh, water. The one emperor moth will produce in the lab 600 eggs. If you were to look at 550 surviving, you peeled off 50 for later use, and you use those 500. And then you went ahead, and that would produce then 3,500 grams, that is three kilos of larvae, and ends up producing 2.1 kilos of dried Mopani flour, which would compose 10 kilos of pillar power, and a child eating 400 calories a day, as you need from the porridge, would be sufficient to feed the child for 100 days. So one cycle could produce 30,000 eggs. So insect time is now. It's a combination of the interest in the world in food, global health, and ecology. There's a series of challenges 
in terms of interacting issues in insects as infant food, the predominant one being funding for research and production. We have issues related to insect production, insect processing, insect consumption, and insect promotion, which you'll hear a lot about from other speakers. So what's the cycle for success? Well, as David suggested, that we have an idea, that we think more about those ideas, develop specific plans, look for funding for the research, develop plants to produce these insects, and then finally try to improve global health. So I've given you a fairly intense slide, sickness perhaps, or given you a headache from these slides. I'll be happy to share the slides with you. You may think that I'm either an airhead, or an idle dreamer, or a joker, or suggesting a whole series of fears related to insects, or rejecting the concept, or even throwing feces. I am a gastroenterologist. I, so Mahatma Gandhi said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. And so I'll be happy to take questions now or in the session or in the panel, and thank you for listening.